Michelle Edelman McCormick. Um, I wear many hats. Today I'm here as a Cooperation in Vermont. My other hat is the uh, general manager of the Worker Owned Cooperative at uh, Marchfield Village Store, and I'm also an organizer, mostly a keyboard warrior with Regeneration Corps. Um, and today we are joined by April Fisher with Food Not Cost. Talia Kuno. Yeah. extra special moment here for April, who's just freaking amazing. Like, you know, the Stop Cop City stuff has been popping off, it's been heating up, and I'm just like, I feel like we should do something. Somebody should say something here in Vermont, like it should be a thing here too, right? So the first call I make is April, and April's like, fuck yeah, we're gonna do a thing. And so we're here doing a thing, and it's all because of April, and I really appreciate that. Next, we have Kali Akuno from Cooperation Jackson and the People's Network for Land and Liberation that uh, Cooperation Vermont is also a part of. And then, um, Kali Livingston. <laughs> Kalia Livingston who organizes with the Free Her campaign here in Vermont. And, um, Can anybody like piece together why the three of these folks, you know, would make sense on the same panel, right? So the idea is like, we're gonna show a couple of videos that's gonna frame a little bit more for folks who may or may not be as familiar with the Stop Cop City uh, movement and where it's currently at. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about the work of, you know, the, the organizations and Kali is gonna talk, you know, from his perspective as part of PNLL about the work at, you know, Stop Cop City right now. And then Kamau is going to zoom in all of the things, you know, being fingers crossed and God the creek don't rise, zoom in at 5.30. And, uh, and we're, we wanted to have, I don't know if it's gonna be possible, because there's a lot of you, which is super exciting. We, were, we had planned to do like breakout sessions and do a thing, but we might flip the script a little bit. Um, we're gonna play it by ear, it's gonna be great. And, uh, but yeah, so that, that, that's the thing. And the important thing that I wanted to like frame here in this moment is really linking what's happening at Stop Cop City in Atlanta with this move to like mil further, let's be clear, further militarize our police forces here in the United States. This is a place where you know, police, you know, forces from all over the country are going to be coming to train on urban warfare, okay? And, and how to, to further, you know, uh, oppress and criminalize our populations and to continue to build our prison systems and that whole prison industrial complex, which is what Free Her here in Vermont is fighting. Is everybody aware that they're trying to build more prisons in the state of Vermont? Is everybody aware that they spent two weeks, just this year, $2 million just on a feasibility study, right? To build a new women's prison here in Vermont. There's 90 to 95 women incarcerated right now in, in the prison here in Vermont. And do the math, right? And so they're trying to build a prison where they're like, well, fuck it, we should just think ahead, right? And like plan for growth, um, but only in our prison system and double the capacity of this new prison that they're trying to build. And uh, I'm gonna be quiet on it, but you get where I'm going with this. And also, has anybody heard that there's a high school here that's not in a school? Is it like a Macy's? Okay, so we're making linkages. I don't think I need to preach to the choir in this room, so I'm really hoping that we're gonna like get up to speed and be thinking really strategically about how we're going to mobilize here in Vermont, right? So that our strategy for a, a housing program for people who I'm clear on are gonna be starting to migrate this direction because of climate change, right? It's this new prison system that we're gonna spend $290 million, our solution to, to how we're gonna be treating internally displaced people? Oh, no. no, not in fucking Vermont. Not while I'm here, how about you? 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 So we need to mobilize before it's too fucking late. That's why I'm here today. And with that, I'm going to pass it to April. Woo! <laughs> 
Thanks, thank you. Occupying this forest is how activists are resisting the construction of a $90 million state-of-the-art police training center protesters call Cop City. The facility will be developed on one of the largest green spaces in Southeast Atlanta, which has a history of oppression. All of it. It will be clear-cut. I cannot wait. They just want to go in and bulldoze everything and write the history the way, the way they want to write it. The fate of the forest is up in the air as the police and forest defenders both refuse to back down. Those people, uh, to me, through their acts, are actually domestic terrorists. Major corporations are pouring millions into this project, financially pressuring politicians to build Cop City. Why did you vote to approve this facility? Surrounding neighborhoods that are more than 75% black say their concerns have been silenced. Our, our opinion doesn't matter. It doesn't count. It's disrespect. And that's what folks who live here ought to be just enraged about. Research shows that stones can help you with grass. That's what I was saying. Hey, I'm Kayla, and I'm one of the AI voices from Revoicer. I can be sad. I still get anxious when I'm like coming down. This forest defender who goes by Fruit Bat has been living in trees for the past six months. You know, the banners that stop destroying Earth. The great thing also is that you don't have to destroy the tree to live in it. These forest defenders are a coalition of activists operating without a centralized leadership. It makes me feel like I'm part of something greater than myself. Fruit Bat is using a pseudonym because he's afraid of getting tracked and punished by authorities. The police, FBI, and other agencies are currently investigating the movement against Cop City. You know, the SWAT team has come through here before and arrested people. Several protesters were arrested during a police raid after a confrontation in which activists allegedly threw Molotov cocktails at officers. Forest defenders say authorities have continued to destroy tree houses during raids. As we toured the forest, we heard gunshots for hours. Gun firing. That's coming from a police firing range that already exists nearby. The plan is to expand that into an 85-acre campus. That's as big as nearly 64 football fields put together. The facility would be one of the biggest in the U.S. As you can see here in a video plan provided by the Atlanta Police Foundation, among the training features will be a bird tower for firefighters, a shooting range, and a mock village including a school and residential homes. But residents who live nearby say they were blindsided by the city's plan to expand the massive police facility. There's never been litter in my backyard. No, no one has reached out to me. I do see when they ask for votes. I do see that. Chenard owns a tow truck business near the proposed facility and lives in a neighborhood that is more than 76% black. The forest is literally probably about um, less than a mile from Lisa Academy. It's kind of like over there where the train at, so. The existing gun range already disturbs his day-to-day -day life. Once the dogs hear fireworks, gunshots, they go to, you know, having all kind of issues, running away. I'm not sure they're trying to force us out of the community, uh, just take over the whole community overall. Uh, but that's what it looked like the way we, the, the, the path we headed down. Atlanta's proposal to construct a police facility here speaks to the land's painful history. The site was a prison farm until 1995. Prisoners there were subjected to harsh punishments and slave conditions, including poor sanitation, nutrition, and overcrowding. Some critics say claims of unmarked graves have not yet been properly investigated. Before that, the land is thought to have been a plantation that enslaved at least 19 people. It was originally stolen from the Muscogee, who lived there until the U.S. government forcefully displaced them to Oklahoma. Today, both activists and tribal members have reclaimed the indigenous name as Bolani People's Park. Local advocates have long called for the area to be preserved as a historical site. As they just can't wait. They cannot wait. They just want to go in and bulldoze everything and write the history the way, the way that they want to write it and be done with it. 
They, they haven't even done proper, you know, ecological surveys yet. But Cop City isn't the only facility that the residents have opposed. Around the forest is a Hollywood studio, sanitation center, juvenile prison, and asphalt and trucking factories. So, that's Key Road landfill. Nobody wants to, do, to address the, the environmental injustice of this. Those issues have never been vetted. The facilities have severely polluted Entrenchment Creek, which flows downstream to the South River. Jacqueline Eccles is trying to prevent the construction of Cop City from an environmental perspective. When we were here about a month and a half ago, uh, we, we pulled uh, 100 cars out of the river and 40, 50 bags of trash. When you look at the river, uh, the creek, not going to be water quality standards. And the cheapest way to improve water quality is to protect the green space. In a 2017 report by the city's planning department, the South River Force was designated one of Atlanta's four major lungs. Now, the city is walking back on its vision to conserve the forest. Uh, to just turn around and have just disrespect the community, because, you know, it, it's not, they, they never cared about the river, so we, we can accept that. But you're disrespecting the people who live inside of Atlanta. And that's what folks who live here ought to be just enraged about. Some neighborhoods around the forest are more than 90% black and are low income with health challenges such as asthma. Getting rid of the green space will also leave them vulnerable to impacts like stormwater flooding. And it's not like you can create a situation to moderate the impact. You can't. As a full-time real estate, I would get tax paperwork, the itemized invoices, 1090. Now keep in mind, during the few times the public did voice their concerns, the overwhelming majority expressed opposition. This is my point of living in Atlanta. There's no place for me without a cop city going on. In fact, one hearing in September 2021 lasted for 17 hours, where around 70% of comments were against cop city. Regardless, city council passed the plan in a 10 to 4 vote. What is going on with the city? Ordinarily, you would have a city who has control over the police. In this case, the police have control over the city. So why did council members approve this facility? It's important to understand the police foundation in Atlanta. It's considered one of the most powerful police foundations in the country. For instance, when the mayor was elected, the CEO of the foundation served on his transition committee. Among those sitting on its board are leaders of corporations like UPS, Wells Fargo, Chick-fil-A, Home Depot, and Delta Airlines. The APF raises investments to finance police projects like Cop City. Of the $90 million needed to build the facility, $60 million will be funded by the foundation's corporate donors. The remaining $30 million will likely be paid by taxpayers. Well before the council voted on the facility, the police foundation had been lobbying council members. And the cost? The city leased the land to the foundation for just $10 per year for the next 50 years. Two of the council members who approved the plan agreed to sit down for an interview. Why did you vote to approve this facility? It's going to be a big recruiting pool. We have a duty, I think, and an obligation to provide our employees with the best in class of uh, everything. But you also have an obligation to listen to what the community is saying, right? Do you feel like you've done that? Yes, I feel that I've done that. Okay. I'm a citywide representative. I move around the city constantly. There were multiple chances for the public to speak. I've never been to a neighborhood planning unit meeting or a neighborhood meeting uh, where I have been told, we don't want this. So why here? One that isn't what I see as a quote unquote forest, especially not an old growth forest, but uh, if you go out to the, to the uh, land, which I've been to many times, uh, there's a lot of invasive species. And those who frequent the park daily say it's brought unique value to the neighborhood. So to them, it may not be a park, but to somebody else, it does be something. And to say it's true, one man's junk is another man's shirt. But these are, these are the same individuals don't even live in the community. They don't care. They don't care. They don't care at all. You say, you say to councilman, would you allow it in your community? Would you allow it to take place in your community? Would you allow a landfill to be built in your community? Would you allow a police uh, uh, academy of this magnitude to be built in your community? The city is determined to proceed with building Cop City. 
Meanwhile, forest defenders have demolished equipment that they say attempted to destroy the forest. It's why not everyone agrees with the way defenders have been resisting. Some of them have embraced militant tactics, vandalizing police and private contractor vehicles. Other critics say they do not represent the communities living in Southeast Atlanta. Okay, we, we don't see eye to eye on everything, but we are here trying to defend the forest. The city spokesperson told AJ Plus the current facilities for officers is inadequate and that the new campus is necessary to give officers, quote, up-to-date urban training. Uh, we have gangs, etc. We have to be, at the very least, at that level, if not above it. Less than three weeks after the police killing of George Floyd, an Atlanta officer fatally shot Rayshard Brooks in the parking lot of the Wendy's. His death reverberated nationwide calls to defund the police, eventually resulting in the burning of the restaurant and the resignation of the city's police chief. But the city's response afterward was to increase police funding to improve officers' morale. Atlanta is one of the most surveilled cities in the U.S. with extensive technology financed by the Police Foundation. Our neighborhoods are essentially occupied by police. Organizers in majority black neighborhoods have been looking for internal solutions to combat violence such as de-escalation tactics. Community Movement Builders says the most pressing issues affecting residents are actually food insecurity and homelessness. Atlanta is you know, known for being a black mecca. It's known for having a lot of black politicians. That a lot of times those decisions that they make are not in the interest of the black masses here who, that are overwhelmingly poor and working class, but rather in the interest of their funders. The Police Foundation has said it's incorporated public opinion by promising 265 acres as green space and that it will also invest in trails for the public. Let me put it this way. Whoever thought of the notion that you can create a park-like environment next to a police training facility, you can go out and walk along the trail and just hear the gunfire go off. It's almost like that's what you're used to anyway, right? So we just bring it at home kind of thing, <laughs> you know? The Police Foundation says it will move forward with the construction and open by the end of 2023. But families and schools are refusing to let that define the future. They're hoping increased awareness will stop the construction. Not all protesters we spoke to were anti-police. Some were hopeful officers could receive better training to deal with non-violent cases involving mental health issues. I'm all for the top training centers. Do it, because the cops need to be trained, but not with the risk of cutting down forests. But they collectively agree they're done letting the city sideline their voices. This fight is not a fight about what City Hall is going to do. This is a fight about what you and I are going to do. City Hall doesn't have the last word on this fight. We have the last word on this fight. Back on the front lines of the movement, forest defenders hope to delay construction by nurturing a communal space. We call this the water buffalo. This is what we use to store water. People are supporting the movement with water and food donations. From all angles of resistance, people living both in and around the forest are determined to embrace the green space as the anchor of community. I've just had so many great experiences in the woods. At least these people are out there enjoying it right now. We're envisioning a society that we want in the future. And the only way to get there is to envision it, to name it, to show it, and to gather people who believe in that vision. You know, the nature, the preserve, the, the wildlife, all that kind of stuff they have brought to this community, and then you're saying, hey, we're just going to take it away? That's not right. That's not right at all.
to the odds that we won. We're going to play four minutes of this as well, then go into the next talking part. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. In Atlanta, Georgia, calls are growing for an independent investigation into the police killing of an activist Wednesday during a violent raid on an encampment of protesters opposed to the proposed $90 million cop city training facility in a public forest. Law enforcement officers, including a SWAT team, were clearing protesters who'd occupied a wooded area outside the center when police claimed they were fired on and fired back. Police say a Georgia state trooper was wounded by gunfire. Activists have now released the name of the victim of the police shooting, longtime activist Manuel Tehran, who went by the name Tortuguita. In an audio statement sent to Democracy Now! Thursday, an Atlanta forest defender describes what happened and who Tortuguita was. They asked to remain anonymous and for their voice to be distorted for security reasons. On Wednesday, January 18th, Multiple police departments descended upon Wheelani and Pupils Park in unprecedented numbers and force. They blocked access to the park on both roads and bike trails. Some people were arrested for attempting to document police actions that day at the park. Gunfire was heard at 9.04 a.m. About a dozen shots fired in rapid succession followed by a loud boom about a minute later. For hours after the murder of Puerto Vita, police continued to hunt, assault, and arrest our brave forest defenders. Those defenders and trees were targeted with pepper bullets. One tree sitter had their tree house, which stored food and water, cut from beneath them. They were left without food and water, for over 12 hours up in the tree as police waited at the base of the tree to capture them. This same tree sitter continued to stay in their tree until the next morning when they were arrested. Other forest defenders were chased by police dogs. These defenders had to hide and flee for their lives, all the while with the nauseating knowing that their dear comrade had been murdered in the sacred land that we call home. Tortuguita was a radiant, joyful, beloved community member. They fought tirelessly to honor and protect the sacred land of the Lulani Forest. They took great joy in caring for each and every person that they came across. Tortuguita brought an indescribable jubilance to each and every moment of their life. Their passing is a preventable tragedy. The murder of Tortuguita is a gross violation of both humanity and of this precious earth which they love so fiercely. Do not turn away from this violence. Do not allow the callousness of the police state to numb your heart. Honor Tortuguita by bravely witnessing the ongoing injustices the police and corporations are enacting upon the Wolani Forest. Honor Tortuguita's legacy by embodying their joyous bravery. Tortuguita's presence on this earth is a gift that will keep on giving for generations to come. It is time for people to join this movement and to say no to this pointless escalation by the police. That was an anonymous statement by an Atlanta forest defender sent to Democracy Now!, his voice disguised. Vigils for the slain forest defender, Tortuguita, have taken place from Los Angeles to Minneapolis to Charlotte to Chicago and Atlanta. Activists held a vigil the night of the shooting and are planning a march on Saturday. For more, we... Yeah, we're going to stop there. I mean, I've seen this footage a bunch, and I've seen a bunch more of it. So maybe let's just take a moment.
already in all of our communities, right? And so I think the degree of uh, intensity and the degree of the scale, the escalation, it varies, but it, it's here. I mean, it, we see it here in Vermont, right? Like, it, it's just, it is a matter of scale. And where, you know, our resources um, are chosen to be put and by whom, right? I think it's going to continue to be a struggle, and I think that struggle is going to continue to get more and more intense as natural resources become more scarce in the country. And I'm going to be quiet for a moment. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to turn it over, you know, to, to April and then Kali and then Kalia to talk about the work that each of their organizations, you know, do, but, you know, focusing, like, more on, you know, the South and the North, right, for you. And, um, and then, you know, just tell those individual stories, and then we're gonna have a conversation about how that links, and then I have some thoughts, and then we're gonna get into discussion. So, April? Do, do, do either of you wanna go before me, or do you want me to go? <laughs> um, Thank you all for coming to this. Um, oh, yeah. Thank you all for coming to this. Um, yeah, obviously, it's really fucked up and it's really scary. Like, Tortuguita could be any of us. Um, and, like, I think it's really incredible that, like, we're all here showing up in solidarity with um, the folks in Atlanta. Like, uh, we had a guest from Atlanta back the f early fall, and like a lot of you were there for that. And I think that there's, uh, yeah, <sighs> it's really important. I think that we're all here, and I really appreciate that. Um, I guess I'm gonna focus on talking about some stuff that's happening in Vermont, which like a lot of you are already involved with. Um, but I'll just start talking about that, and then maybe we can kind of make connections between all these things that we're talking about. Um, I'm part of Food Not Cops, which is a mutual aid organization that um, has been going on before I got here a year and a half ago. They started in the pandemic, and uh, we've been doing free lunch every single day. Um, it is uh, at the Marketplace garage, parking garage, on uh, Cherry Street across from Walgreens. And uh, all sorts of folks come to the, the, uh, the free lunch, a lot of unhoused folks, just food insecure people in general. And um, it's been like an incredible space for um, people to come together. I know for myself, like I didn't like have friends who are unhoused really prior to joining this organization. I think it's, I've learned a lot um, from our comrades housed and unhoused. And I think it's really been a uh, jumping off point for a lot of actions that have happened in um, this town uh, and like a lot of and okay, I'll say one more thing about the org and then, um, that like so sort of one other thing that we sort of launched about a year ago now is like the daily cooking night which has been cooking for the daily distro every night at a different person's house if you are interested in getting involved in cooking let me know, uh, or you could go to Food Not Bombs Vermont Instagram, and we'll get you involved. And we got cooking every single night. Um, so people, a lot of people ask, why is it called Food Not Cops? And uh, like, there's a million ways to answer that question. For me, um, it's about creating these community structures so that we can, one, have political power to resist the police, and two, have the community power so that we didn't need the police anyway, but we definitely don't need the police when we have each other. And like a concrete example, um, there have been like multiple like emergency situations that have happened in the community that uh, even when the police were called, the police were not helpful. And we called on the people who we knew from Food Not Cops and it was because we already knew each other from cooking every night and going to this distro because we already had these connections that we were able to like de-escalate the situation and we didn't need the police. And then the other way is a lot of people in this room were also at 
the Sears Lane encampment, which happened last year, which is for folks who don't know, it was um, an encampment of unhoused people in the South End, and uh, the police bulldozed the camp. Uh, but we were able to delay the bulldozing for a month uh, because there are activists camped out there, and the overlap between the folks there and from our cops was very strong. Um, so I think the importance of mutual aid like food not costs is we're able to build the community power to both resist the state and then also keep each other safe. And there's still a lot of work to do on both those fronts. Um, but I think that we have a structure in place that we are working off of to accomplish those goals. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna turn it over to Helene. Actually, can you everyone. My name is Kalia Livingston. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I apologize for the low energy today. You are seeing real life burnout. Um, so I have a bit of anxiety, but I'm happy that I was invited to be here. Um, I am a Vermont resident. I was born and raised in Burlington, um, and I currently am one of the campaign organizers for the Free Her Vermont campaign, which um, is ran by the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. And that is an organization that was founded by Andrea James in 2010, and um, our hub is out of Massachusetts. Um, so the, miss the mission of our organization is to end incarceration for people in women's prisons, and to do that, we um, tackled that work through three bodies of work, which is reimagining communities, policy work, and our Free Her campaign. Um, the Free Her campaign is a New England-wide campaign, so here in Vermont, we are focusing on the Vermont carceral state, and um, a little bit of what Michelle mentioned earlier, the state is trying to build four new prisons for $250 million, and we are advocating to stop that construction and reinvest that money into our communities and the many needs that we have in our communities, um, housing being number one, substance use, education and services, things for wellness and um, hum humanities in general. Um, we all know what we need in our Vermont communities instead of prisons and we shouldn't be expanding the carceral state. Um, why I'm here today is to talk about the, the um, excuse me, the connection between what's happening in Atlanta with no cop city, um, and with them wanting to build this strongly built as institution where they, where they plan to train police all over the state. We're seeing how in Burlington, um, the police have been defunded, but they are advocating to get that funding back and expand the police state. So we're seeing how what's happening in Atlanta can very much affect what's happening here in Vermont, and we can see how that militarization can take place here while they're also trying to expand the carceral state with these four new prisons. Um, I feel like I'm kind of going on a tangent, but um, I'm, like I said, I'm a little bit burnt out, so I'm kind of going going on a run on, but I um, just really wanted to come here and connect with other people in the community and talk about work that other folks are doing because I believe that what we need to do to reimagine Vermont communities is happening and we haven't quite built that bridge to to really um, bring our movement together and get to a place of abolition. Um, so I hope that we can start having more of these conversations and connecting our work and seeing how all of you and all of us on the ground can have abolition in mind as we are doing the different things that we do to um, in our social justice movements. Um, I might have a little bit more to add if people have questions, but I'm gonna leave it there for now. I appreciate you all being here, um, and I'll give it to you. Well, <clears throat> let me start with a couple of very Sub subjective questions for you all. <clears throat> and you answer how you feel free to answer. Uh, the first question is how many people in here consider themselves creatures of the left? <laughs> now, to be clear, because you know, people use that term very differently. I use it to mean people who identify and attempt to practice some form of anarchism 
socialism, communism, or revolutionary nationalism. Right? That's how I use it. You may use it differently. You got to, you know, uh, write to your perspective on that. So about half the room raise your hands. So how many of you would consider yourself to be liberals? <coughs> You said the same thing. I would say they're not the same. Well, like when you said left, like it uh -huh. depends on like what. When you said left originally, like I don't really trust Democrats or Republicans, so they're just caught up with the politics of it. But yes, socialism, yes, community building over it. Mm -hmm. So yes, liberal, but depending on the perspective and how you define it. So I'm asking this, this, this question for very practical reasons around political clarity and the type of clarity I think we need in a time like this. Uh, I mean, if you didn't really know that much about Atlanta, you would assume that that place was being run by <clears throat> Donald Trump or DeSantis, right? From the, the, the type of policies and things that they're pushing. Atlanta's a Democrat-run city. That's right. And it's a black Democrat run city, right? A, a city run by black Democrats since the 1960s, the late 1960s, right? It was, it was noted uh, for having, for being one of the, the first major cities in the South, particularly the Deep South, to have a black mayor, right? Who then shepherded in one of the most major economic transformations in the Deep South by bringing uh, the Atlanta airport Right, of securing that contract and then bringing that airport to Atlanta. Now that airport was originally designed to be in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, and why is this important? Um, although it sounds local, we got to put a lot of this stuff in geopolitical perspective, right? And so the U.S. military and U.S. government wanted that airport in one of those two particular places because of its strategic location, both relative to how the U.S. Geography, geography fits within itself, so production and transportation inside the United States, but also its positioning relative to you know, the broader game of uh, how they monitor and, and utilize their military assets to try to control the world. So when you see Atlanta, you got to put it in that context. And understand that Cop City is not just a local little trivial thing. This is a deep international project, something that the capital and the state and both of all these little factions are both deeply invested in. Right? And so one of the things I think is sorely missing, I lived in Atlanta for five years. Uh, uh, worked for the U.S. Human Rights Network for the time that I was there. And in the time I was there, worked with a group of students uh, at Georgia State University. Uh, to tackle a program called Gilly. I want y'all to look it up. I had to look it up again myself since it's been a couple of years. But Gilly stands for Georgia International Law Enforcement Exchange. And this is a program that's been going on basically since the late 1980s that directly uh, interfaces Atlanta, the Atlanta PD, Atlanta sheriffs, and the sheriffs around that region that get directly trained by Israeli military forces and have been for many years now. Now this is just one of those particular little sinkholes. So if you think this just is about well they need a larger shooting range or they need, hell no, that ain't got nothing to do with what this is about. Uh, and without a deeper an, an analysis and presentation of this, this piece while the AJ piece is good, it's totally out of context. Because you just think they killed Tortuguita because they were like mad or upset or that they're pursuing this because they just don't like anarchists or they ain't got nothing to do with that, right? This is a vital project that they need particularly to go through because they are very clear, both sides of this Democrat and, and, and Republican coin, that the next phase of governance domestically is going to have to be a brutal one. Right? They are going to have to govern or attempt to govern through more direct application of, of force against all of us. Not just black folks, not just indigenous folks, not just Latinos, all of us. Reason being, despite how you know, they want to you know, portray 
the economy is, you know, it's got the lowest uh, unemployment rate since the 1950s, and um, you know, the the jobs are growing and expanding. Uh, but they themselves will, didn't tell you on MSNBC and CNN, even though all this supposedly is doing great, most of the American public, you know, is, is totally uncomfortable with the economy. So you got figures that don't add up to reality, right? And they totally misaligned the figures. Like if I got to work three or four jobs, just basically to make in meet and then have other little side hustles, whether they legal or illegal, you know, to make things meet, something is deeply wrong with, with this society and where it's going. And it cannot deliver on the goods or the imperial promises that they used to make to, to white folks. It's like, y'all go with this program and we'll give you these material rewards. Well, when you can't get the material rewards anymore, what does that lead to? If that's what so much that they were banging their rule on, right? Uh, and this is critical for us, I think, to understand because they, they it is about ideology to a, a large degree. Why, you know, there's so many reactionary forces that have come, come to the fore. Uh, and why fascism or neo-fascism is growing. But there's also a material dimension to this. Like the empire cannot deliver on the goods and services it once promised, right? And if you want to break it down in some simple ways, they can't promise white men that they would have what their grandfathers once had, you know, uh, in the position that they once had. Uh, and once that promise is gone, the, le the last thing that's available for them to really consolidate their rule is the stick. So they're going to be building sticks everywhere. This is just one of the more advanced columns, like one of the more advanced columns. And I think the piece that we have to really figure out in terms of political clarity, why I ask that very subjective question, because we have to figure out, I think those of us in this room, whether you consider yourself left or liberal, really doesn't matter. The question is, what are we trying to, to advocate? What is our program? What is our vision for another society? a different society, a humane society, egalitarian society, how do we work on that together despite our political differences? Because that's what it's really going to come down to real quick. And what's happening, you know, uh, uh, over at Rilani People's Park, there's a small little exercise in there. Because folks should know, you know, the Cop City struggle has actually been going on for a couple of years now, right? It's, it's starting to get a little bit more currency, which is a good thing. But one of the reasons why, if we're being truthful, it hasn't gotten a lot of coverage that I think is rightly should have been getting for years is because it's primarily been led by a group of young white anarchists, right, who've been occupying the forest. And a bunch of, you know, liberal forces, I'm gonna call them liberals, you know, be they black or otherwise, who are more in the mainstream of political activism being directed and guided and, you know, through nonprofit organizations don't want to or have been uh, avoided about getting engaged or being involved in something that directly necessitates direct action and sustained direct action, right? And it, it wasn't until there was, you know, uh, an execution and then some direct action in response that it's now blew up. Uh, but this is something like if we wait too long to figure out these, these pieces, we wind up getting involved in the struggle at a high level when it's pr practically almost over. So there's a lot to be learned from this that is gonna have to be, you know, I think really applied, and I'm asking this question primarily for Vermont. Because the, the you know, studying from afar, you know, some of the stuff around the prison stuff, uh, you know, was talking to Michelle the other day uh, and I remember when first, if she first sent me, or somebody, somebody, one of y'all may have done it, because I know with some of the listeners I'm now <clears throat> involved in, they had to stop her campaign. I immediately was like, yeah, you know, they ramping up, certain elements of Vermont are ramping up the constructions of prisons because this is how they are getting prepared for the shifts that are coming. So it's, to me, it's not just a campaign that's just about abolition, or pro approach it from an abolitionist perspective. That's a, to me, that's a starting point. The larger point is, what does this mean for the vision of Vermont and who's going to basically win that, that struggle about what the future of this place looks like and should look like, and then how are you going to organize the various social forces to execute that vision? That's a question that we have to answer uh, together that I think this should bring into some, some 
particular focus. And then we need to be, and then I'm gonna stop, we need to be mindful why I brought up the international peace and the militarism peace. That's here in Vermont. That's very much here in Vermont. And looking at some of the plans that, uh, um, that I've seen here recently, that Biden is trying to move through you know, with Bernie, one of the critical things that they seem to be trying to put on the plate around this new infrastructure, it's a lot of military stuff that's in there. A lot, right? And in my view, that's a, that's a piece that Bernie has always been a little bit weak on, to put it bluntly or put it mildly. So, uh, I think you know we need to start doing some deep homework on what they're proposing coming down the pipeline, so we can get ahead of it, get ahead, you know, ahead of the curve, and try to start blocking it. That's the fight dimension, and then get much more clear about what it is we want to build and how is it going to take us organizing together to actually execute that. So I'm gonna stop there. this out um, in uh, the YouTube video. Uh, this, the, uh, South River Forest is an unincorporated part of DeKalb County, which is actually not in Atlanta. They have no representation on the Atlanta City Council. So these people were really screwed. Um, the other thing, they were allowed to put representatives on the Advisory Council, but they were told on the Advisory Council, you have no vote. You can make recommendations about um, trees will be planted or trails, um, and but absolutely no power to um, you know to a vote of whether yay or nay when this happened. Um, a representative on the advisory council has resigned, and uh, she is appealing um, the environmental study on the, the watershed and the environmental study. And she's probably going to get standing because her home is 250 feet from the forest. So there might be possible there could be at least a temporary stop work um, order on this. There's just been a lot of cover up and a lot of whitewash. And uh, there was a very good article in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago from Richard Power who wrote over story. And my comment on it when I wrote in was follow the money. Atlanta corporations are funding this and exactly what you were saying. Follow the money. I've been writing to CEOs and getting exposed <coughs> back. But we just gotta bombard these people and expose them for what they're doing. The last thing I want to comment, I don't know if I can do this without crying. My daughter is a good was a good friend of George Kitas. And they work together. And his uh, she was with his family today. And um, they had his final service, and um, his ashes were placed in the forest this morning. Yes, Yeah, I've been hearing, I remember the forest defenders were calling for solidarity actions across the country. There's been like a map published of all the connected. Uh, contractors with the construction of the forest and their subcontractors. And I was hearing something the other day about a protest or a calling being called about the Atlas construction company. I think they're over in Williston. I don't know what day that's happening or what exactly is going on. Uh, I can not take it. I think Atlas wanted to do it on the 17th of the 17th. That's, that's something we were talking about. But there's something else that's been going around on social medias, but I haven't heard specific stuff. So anybody know about that? I know they have a subcontractor in Williston. I heard about a protest at this spot. Yeah, I heard, I heard too, like, sorry, uh, Extinction Rebellion's planning something for the week of February 20th. 
I heard. Thank you for bringing that up. And <coughs> when I know more information, I'll let you know. We could like spread it around. I think we got everyone's emails in here. So, uh, and if you didn't put your email on the list, uh, talk to Andrew in the back corner there. He's been collecting emails. He could get you on the email list. And uh, maybe we could plug in about, about this uh, thing in Williston the week of the 20th. What do you think? No, I've seen, I've seen a, a couple of little things floating around on that, but that may be a question for Kamal when he gets on, being much more central to, to you know, the planning on the ground in Atlanta. I have a question, I guess, for Peter or all of you, but I'm curious if, if you have a take on like the corrections officers union and the understaffing that is happening in Vermont prisons or whatever, you know, according to their thing, and if there's like, that just might sound crazy, but some sort of unlikely alliance between like, I don't know, I don't really know really well, uh, but I just feel like the, the corrections officers are kind of the front line of the drug war or of uh, dealing with the, the opioid crisis, which is one of the major problems that I think is afflicting a lot of time. And so, yeah, I don't know if there's a way to like throw a curveball and like do something somehow collaborating with the existing forces of the corrections. I don't know. But like, but like corrections officers are not great, obviously. Obviously. But like, they're already like only from the labor perspective, they're already understaffed, Correct. and they're trying to build more facilities. Like, yeah, only from the labor perspective. Like, no, corrections officers are bad, but. I, um, I don't know too much information about that union specifically, um, but I have a little bit of information just in general about uh, the career of being a corrections officer. And there have been studies that have shown that um, being a corrections officer takes, I think, 15 years off of the average 75 years that a person would get in this country. So there really isn't an incentive even to be working in a prison. Um, so I think that that is something that should be considered and why are we building new prisons if people don't even want to work in them. It's, it's not beneficial to their health. We're hurting Vermonters, the people that you're putting in the cages, as well as the people that you're trying to employ in these places as well. Did you have a thought to comment? I do, but I don't know if Russ had his hand up. Was that a question? Yeah, well, that, I just wanted to tip it on to Mike. And I, you know, um, some of these are uncomfortable conversations and the space that we're moving into strategically is not a space that we've been in historically. And that space sometimes looks like, and specifically in spaces like Vermont, um, where there are not a lot of people of color and folks always asking, you know, what can we do? Well, that type of work that Mike is proposing is the very uncomfortable type of work that is actually needed, but nobody actually really wants to do it. No one wants to go to another white person who he's just asked in so many words, well, who's in the room? Okay, well, none of those people are in the room. Not, none of the union for the officers are in the room. So it's part of our job to actually go to them. And I know that's been very uncomfortable historically in these spaces, is for us to go across the line outside of the choir that we preach and listen to. And especially um, if you're white or European and have that ability to actually cross that line and them not even know that you crossed the line. So that level of work is needed. Yes, you're gonna be uncomfortable. Yes, you're gonna be saying, I'm sitting here with the police trying to convince police and prison guard unions to not be policed in prison guard unions. So, but yes, yes, because I work with an organization called Building for the Future, so that is what we do. You know, that's the work that we do. So, so mitigating racism for a person like me um, looks like that all the time, but it also looks like me working with the victims, but it also looks like always thinking about the uncomfortable work, because this is easy. Yeah, my, what, what I was going to add on that comes from, 
you know, growing up in California. Mm -hmm. And and two things I would say about about that. Every actually about this is in the seventies, eighties, nineties. You could track the growth of uh, prisons by the complaints of the prison the prison union, right? The, of that particular uh, set of forces. There was always indication that California was about to do another round of expansion. Right, because they would always start complaining. Typically, about four years before that, the, the next cycle of appropriation, they would start complaining. Hey, we understaffed, we're stressed out, you know, blah blah blah. And, and then uh, they would use that as a negotiating tactic. They they settled in the con their, their contract. Typically, about two years before the announcement of we're going to expand Long Park, or we're going to expand, you know, some new division of San Quentin, or we're going to do X Y. They would always do that. Right, and then it was it was a it was a piece that I think at least the elders that trained me got really hip to in the late 1980s about this is a way that we can kind of track how this is going to play out and, and flow and, and and try to get ahead of it. Um, and what <clears throat> uh, I don't think it worked that well, but I know there was an effort. Uh, in California to infiltrate that union from, from the activist side. And so folks were, you know, uh, recruited and trained to war in to that union. Uh, and then in the early 2000s, they, they, some of them, I think, got exposed for their movement, you know, uh, kind of history. And then, but that came about primarily because the movement started to question some of the people who they sit in, like y'all have actually gone to the other side, <laughs> right? Like you're not doing what we actually do. Uh, so, uh, but the deeper part, and I, I'll stop, like look, you know, um, some of this is Vermont specific, right? So it's, it's a very particular question and folks here will kind of have to tend to and figure out I would tend to agree here from what I what I know, which is limited. That that, that should be what Russia, that should be a, some form of organizing pursuit, but then put it in the, the national context that we just witnessed and experienced around the, the George Floyd rebellion, right? Uh, and how that changed so many of the conversations, you know, about police funding and carceral funding and all that stuff. And how right now, at least the dominant wing of the Democratic Party has doubled down on Biden, we don't want to defund the police, we want to fund the police even more. Right? Um, so put that in the context. Like yeah, that, that's what you mean. That's what you mean. Real quick, I think like my the focus is like the drug problem that exists. Uh, there's a serious opioid crisis in my team. And I want a non carceral solution. And I think that's the bill part, right? And like if it's possible to get the correction officers who are already fucked in over work. You let them know we're, we can't because we can't incarcerate the problem in the way we can't. Prisons are not the place to deal with the drug crisis, and it's affecting us. Well, I hear you. I, I, to me, that, that is a line of, that would be, if you could pull that cool, that would be pretty <laughs> simple. <laughs> that would be that would be some damn organizing. Sound like a challenge, though. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta speak up whether I want to or not. Uh, there's a sense that there's no one connected to the corrections unit in the room, but actually I'm a retiree of the uh, Vermont State Employees Union, the VSEA, that is the union that the corrections unit is a part of. And uh, my last 12 years of working was for the Department of Corrections. Um, I did retire in 2013, so it's been a long time. And my last 12 years were out of the facilities uh, in the victim services program out of Gary probation and parole. But for a few years, from 1998 to um, 2002, I was in the facilities. And for the first year and a half of that, I was a temp CO. So I do 
I entered in my mid-60s with my gray hair. I was a little unusual. Um, but I do have the experience of being a CEO in the Vermont system. I'll just say one other thing, because it actually connects, I think, to the possibility of working with these folks. Uh, what, what got me in there, I needed a temp job, and I was tired of being a temp secretary, and uh, so I ended up being a temp CEO. It, it's really screwed up that Vermont has all these temp CEOs. It's, it's a mess. But anyway, that's how people get in as, as temps. Um, but the reason why I decided to uh, actually do it and stick with it is that I learned, um, I learned that in the, in the Vermont state statutes, somewhere in the mid-90s, uh, it was put in statute that the state of Vermont believes in restorative justice. Okay. So that was taught to us in the, in the um, academy. And then you graduate from the academy and you get into the facility and then you see that 99% of the COs are coming from a different place. So, um, but I, really good that you brought that up and there, there are some possibilities. Thank you. And um, would you be willing to stay and talk to him for a few minutes afterwards? Sure. It's very rare, I mean, raise your hand if you disagree, that we get that perspective when we're having conversations. I think it's really valuable. And I did raise my hand about being a creature of the left. Oh, you did? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's one. Yes. Oh, did I miss you? No. Hi. Come on, yeah. please. Uh, you first, and then you. Let me get ahead. Yeah, I like the idea of getting ahead of some of these. Um, policies that are in the works and you know we all see the writing on the wall um, just wondering what are some you know positive examples of what community organization looks like and then also maybe like an opinion on the centralization of the organization or the decentralized orientation of people working together you know basically going up against a highly centralized enemy um, but yeah I just uh, I want to build with all y'all. Let's, um, let's do something together. I'm going to ask you one thing if I can, and then I'm going to ask you because there was a two part question. It was like centralization versus decentralization, some examples of like you know, possible models, right? Mm -hmm. And also, I have a short group, of course, complex. Um, but also, <laughs> just mostly like, what are like, this, what does it look like? To, you know, what's a, what's a good, you know, model of what a, organized community looks like, you know, how, how, how do yeah. we do that? So the, the, the second part, I just wanted, because this is something I've been thinking a lot about lately, probably often, but really a lot lately, right? About this real need to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time, right? And the need in a, a Mel Figueroa keeps using this term, we have to use all the tools in our toolbox, right? But none of us is the master of all trades, right? And so sometimes I think in, in our spaces, you know, some of us will be like, oh, policy and oh, you know, electoral politics work or oh, you know, the people who are just like hanging out trees and, you know, it's so like there's this, this, this uh, segmentation and stigmatization of people who do different kinds of movement work at different levels, right? And there's criticism about their effectiveness in all, all the directions and whether that's too disruptive or it's just like not disruptive enough. And it's like, I, I feel like we just really, really, really have to be able to work together, right? Like, I don't know, that's a fucking revolutionary thought, right? And to give space to each other to do that work, right? We have to use all the tools in our toolbox, right? And again, None of us is going to be the master of all trades. We cannot all be policy experts and be people who are learning how to, you know, build um, uh, barricades in the forest, right? Like, the, we're not the, the same skill set. But we all need to be talking together, collaborating, strategizing, and giving each other, you know, the respect and the due course to, to do the work that we do. But we have to be talking to each other, folks. Like, we just have to. And, uh, 
That question, both of those questions you asked could be deep rabbit hole questions. Yeah, sure. um, I, I'll try to answer the second one by saying, you know, I think I'm a person who believes that form follows function. Um, so I'm not wedded either to uh, a decentralized form of organizing or hierarchy. I'm really not. It really depends on what we're trying to accomplish and what it will take to get, get that particular mission and task things done. Now, as a general principle, this is a, you know, there's, a, there's a difference is that you want to be as democratic as possible, right? As time, energy, and conditions will allow to live to the utmost. And you fight for that principle. <clears throat> but there are some things that, look, uh, is it possible for a highly decentralized force to defeat something as centralized as the United States government and, and all of its military? And from a quantum mechanics perspective, yes. <laughs> yes, that might be possible, right? But in a general sense, there's no way that's going to happen, right? Um, just because they have so much command and control over the resources, that all of us, you know, need to survive. Um, and we just don't have the capacity to, to efficiently, sufficiently withhold resources from them to execute their violence. Uh, that don't mean it can't happen, but you're talking about, a, if for that to happen, you're talking about a level of unity and a level of organization we've never come close to, to attain. So if, if, I'm, if you're asking me whether uh, <laughs> That can defeat that? No, not not at this particular point in time. But to get to a point of also having something that's centralized enough to, to take that head on, it will not allow that to happen. So we're left in the quandary, right? Then you're gonna need a little bit of both, right? To I think to, to take that on. And the question becomes when and where and to do what, right? Uh, keep your principles to the greatest extent possible. But at some point. Like if, if, if uh, for like what's, what's going on here right now, to me, honestly, yeah, that needs to be decentralized. You know, for a lot of different reasons. One of them, to a certain extent, it, it, it will secure it. You know, uh, I would assume, the reason I would say that, just to put it point blank, I would assume that the state has already infiltrated that camp. Yeah. Right, and it, it's got people in there doing disruptive stuff, setting up stuff, tort may have been set up. Let's be, be, be honest. We don't know, right? But at least in terms of some people being able to have mobility, being able to, to walk away, being able to come in and out, be somewhat anonymous, you need to be centralized. Because if there's too much of a centralized point, and it's too many, two, one or two people who hold all that central information, infiltrate that, you got everything you want. So having to be centralized helps it for this particular tactical range. Is it going to be able to withstand the military pressure if it's just the forest defenders trying to defend themselves, right, without a broad encirclement from the community that's able to, to at least provide a, a front line and provide both moral and a certain level of material support to them? Like if those two things come together, we have a possibility of, of, of winning the struggle. If it's just the forest defenders, that's not going to last. I'm just going to be, be real with you. It's just not going to last that long, right? It'll be bold. It'll inspiring, but it will go down to defeat. We learned a lot of lessons from it, so I'm not saying it's not worth doing, but it will ultimately wind up losing. So this, this inside-outside has to be coordinated, and to me, the, in, the inside, that being the force, that should be as decentralized as possible. To scale up the outside, though, there needs to be more centralized coordination of that. So it form follows function. Um, we got to reach the masses, too, you know, and I think that seems like that's and there's different ways to do that, right? And I think there that like some audiences are going to respond, you know, to a call from a famous person. Some audiences ain't don't give a shit about that. I'm inspired by what 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 it's actually about, not some celebrity encouraged me to come, right? But I think you need both. Going back to Michelle's point, we need a little bit of both, and it just be clear about what role to me, you know, being mature left is revolutionary, but just being clear about what your role is. 
Right? Well, this is this is this is the role I play at this particular point in time. Five years from now, I might be in a different role, right? Uh, for a lot of different reasons. Some of my own choosing and making, some not. Like that. That's just the way this thing, you know, kind of plays out. But it's being willing to shift. This is what a democratic principle comes in. You might be the best spokesperson for this. Like Kamal, we go back, good comrade of me and Russell for a long, long time. Uh, and I think he's playing a particularly good role in what's going on now. But he's also very clear, I'm not in the force. I'm not ever going in the force, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, I'm good at what I do. I can rock this mic. I, I'm, uh, I'm a trained lawyer. Yeah, I, I, gotta leave. I can do X, Y, and Z. This is my role. Right, but I'm not going. You know, I think it's like I'm not speaking for the people in, in the force. That's their role, right? So you have a kind of division of labor that I think helps. We got to be clear on that. Then it keeps like the ego and the competitive shit down, and we're kind of clear about what our roles are and what we want to what we want to play. And people d democratically choosing to play those roles rather than just being assigned those roles. That's a that's a particular piece. Now your second question. Again, depends on what what you are looking for, right? It's kind of like these ideal communities kind of thing. I would say for, this is one of the big contradictions that we got to, to figure out. In terms of like being able to operate on high levels of, of uh, unity that typically comes when, when the people confronting a certain situation are very clear on the necessity of having to be organized in that level. Right, having to have a community and having to rely upon each other. I would wager uh, in the United States anyway, look, I'm gonna keep examples there. The tightest examples you're gonna find of that are actually in migrant communities. Yeah. Right, because they, you know, for them to survive and deal with the raids and, you know, like, you know, shit got to be tight, right? You know, uh, or be dead. Yeah, you know, you know, or, or be, be deported or, or worse. Right, so what are the lessons could be learned from looking at the, the contradiction is, you know, the, the reality of a lot of situation is when that necessity for the tightness eases, that community typically breaks. And so a large part of what folks are trying to organize is for all the creature comforts that we have that are endowed by a certain level of citizenship. So it's like, how do you, how do you keep the urgency, right, and build the unity? And to me, that's what, that's why I ask, I want to just be frank with you. That's why I asked the political clarity question. So, like to me, if if I hear a lot of people talking about, you know, fascism is coming, fascism is coming. I was, yeah, yeah, it is coming. You know, for, and for some of us, it ain't never went nowhere. It's always been. But okay, it's, it's it's coming in a more obvious and direct fashion. If this is our analysis, we ain't organizing ourselves as if that was a political reality. Let's be real. We're not. Right? And, and there's still, even amongst folks who call themselves preachers of the left, they're still just thinking that, that uh, we should vote harder and we're going to keep DeSantis or Trump or the rest of these fascist folks from acquiring enough power to you know, either enslave us in some you know, new form of fashion or old form of fashion or just outright kill us. Right? And we're thinking that the electoral and bourgeois politics and the bourgeois legality and the, the, the law is going to defend us. When fascists get in power, the only way they get out of power is when they get killed. Mm -hmm. So if, if you understand, if you really know that and you're a student of history, ain't no fascists ever gotten power Love and been yeah. and left on their own accord mm -hmm. because somebody voted them out of office. Mm -hmm. It don't work that way. Yeah, sure right? It don't work that way. And we're not, that's <laughs> one of the first couple of hard conversations that we're not having. We ain't having that hard conversation. We need to. We'll take one more quick question and then Kamal's gonna wait. Can I ask I guess Kamal's gonna pop Kamal's gonna pop on whatever he pops on and we'll yes. yeah. um well real I just wanna speak really quick to like you asked about like examples like of things happening, like definitely you mentioned uh migrant organizing. Everybody if you don't know the organization Migrant Justice in Vermont, check them out, they do amazing work. They're looking for volunteers, particularly volunteers who can drive. I've done it before, it's cool. Hit them up. You don't have to speak Spanish, though it helps. Uh, read his book, Jackson Rising, if you want to hear about incredible organizing happening in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, really, I'm trying to tell us, or are we going to move on? Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. I, I love okay. your justice. If you want to volunteer or yeah. come through, come talk to me about it. I can actually show places to go. Um, 
I just wanted to say one thing on the on the last question that was asked. With the Free Her campaign, we are um, organizing from a decentralized lens. We have a campaign called the Distributive Organizing Campaign, where we are trying to build an autonomous movement, regardless of who's involved, um, where we are going into the community and spreading awareness about this prison construction and, and just trying to shift public opinion in general about incarceration. Um, and as we bring people into our movement, they we're empowering them to be leaders themselves, to spread this message themselves. And I think that that um, has been, we've been doing this for about six months. It's myself and another campaign organizer, Jaina Ossoff, and we have a group of um, core team volunteers as well who work with us. and. Um, it's like I said, we've been doing this for about six months and we've seen um, a fair amount of movement and the solidarity that we've been able to build in the community has been a success for me at least. It's hard to know what is successful and how to like see that in a tangible way, but like Michelle was saying earlier, I think that um, move, moving from all different angles is important. Um, one thing that we're focusing on right now is policy work and we're pushing a prison moratorium bill which um, we're asking for a five-year pause on all jail and prison construction, including juvenile prisons in the state. Um, and that doesn't include any renovations on any current buildings that exist. Um, and the state actually also has a moratorium on, on school construction. So we're asking for that to be lifted while simultaneously um, asking for a prison moratorium. So, um, <laughs> the idea is that we want to get everybody, as many people who are interested and involved in this, and that this is something that you can pick up and spread in your networks, in your community, and really get this, the momentum going because this is our state, We're, this is our movement, and no one can um, monopolize on that. So I think that it's important that everybody can see their role in, in, these, in these movements and um, pick up the link wherever they can. But I'll just leave you there. I think I'm out of the Uh, sorry, yes. I can, you, can you see everyone in the room? There's a lot of people here. Now, yeah. I, you know, I, it, I was about to make jokes. There's going to be a little, you know, it's like there's three people. It's like, oh, wait a minute, there's a room full of people here. <laughs> hey, everybody. I do see you next time. Come out, introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Mount Franklin. I am an organizer and the founder of a, of a group called Community Movement Builders. We do grassroots organizing in Atlanta and we have a few smaller chapters in some other places. Uh, we do a lot of work around sustainable development, um, which means uh, doing things along the lines of having mutual aid work that we do with the community, for the sustainability fund to help folks pay rent, mortgage, utility, um, uh, yeah, it's rent, mortgage, utility bills. Uh, we have cooperatives. Um, in fact, uh, the, the Vermont uh, store may be selling our sea moss. Uh, yes. Hopefully, it's sold out by now. Mm -hmm. But um, if not, we, we should, hopefully, after this, you guys will go buy some. <laughs> um, and then we also do a lot of organizing. We organize around the issue of gentrification, particularly <laughs> in Southwest Atlanta, where the last few working class and most more black communities left intact in Atlanta. And we also do a lot of work to stop Cop City and around the issue of police violence in general. Okay. Kamal, can you give us an update on the latest and greatest for the Stop Cop City? You know, because we're we yeah. lag behind on like whatever we can catch in the media. I'm trying to group. Be, uh, but uh, quickly uh, let folks know. So, comedy uh, was something that was in the works with the Atlanta Police Foundation for a number of years, probably dating back 2017 18, but it was something that was a high priority. After the uprising of 2020, which happened, of course, around the country, if not even around the world, um, where people like um, Rashad Books in Atlanta was killed, Breonna Taylor, uh, George Floyd were killed by the police. Here in Atlanta, part of the reaction it became to build uh, what we've dubbed Cop City, basically uh, one of the largest military, uh, police militarized training zones in the country. Um, and we see that as a direct reaction of the 2020 uprisings. 
because it seems to be rushed out really after those things took place. Um, in addition, as the rest of the country was talking about uh, abolition of police, defunding the police, and or finding alternatives uh, for public safety, uh, here in Atlanta, they sort of dug down to so the idea of Cop City, their words, that I was their words being the city officials, was us to build the morale of the police back up, right? So this was a morale booster. In addition to what they said it was, what we also think, as I said earlier, is that the idea of Cop City comes out of the idea that they want to militarize the police even more to fight back against movements that challenge police violence and other uh, demonstrations in the street. We think it's further going to over-police against black and brown communities. Uh, the facility itself is going to have over a dozen shooting ranges, two mock cities to practice urban warfare and crowd control. Uh, it's going to have a landing pad for a black hawk helicopter. Uh, it's going to have bars and restaurants and places for the police to congregate. It's going to have a, a space for uh, explosive devices to be set off. Uh, and it's going to be military grade in terms of its build out. Uh, 43% of the police that are going to be so called trained at this facility are going to be from outside of Georgia. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Georgia police already do training with the Israeli police force. And so for us, we say that that means that the same tactics that are used against Palestinian communities are going to be brought here to be used against movements here in black and brown communities. And the same tactics here uh, that are used to get smooth mids and black and brown community is all going to be exported out to Israel, so it's in this state at least believe. And so we think this is not, of course, the only way in which the police are militarizing or the first way, but we think this is a way in which they are building a national strategy around common tactics, uh, ideas, and the implementation of strategies, which is what impact all of us who are involved in movement politics. Protesters hit the ground almost at the beginning of hearing the announcement of Cop City. Um, we did what you would call standard uh, organizing campaign tactics, everything from town hall to petition drives to rallies, marches, to demonstrations. Uh, and even during that time, early on in the movement, uh, the police busted up some of those rallies and made arrests, right? We had over 17 or 18 arrests uh, during that time period in a year and a half of organizing against Cop City. Uh, um, we had a whole bunch of arrests, but those, those charges were mostly uh, the administration. So uh, those standard charges if you're an organizer, right? Things that you face all the time. Uh, after the legislation was passed by the city, which granted the lease to the Atlanta Police Foundation, which is a private foundation, which is going to run the training for the police, right? They passed the lease, giving them access to this land for the next 20 years at $10 a year. Um, and I should also say that this, this, the place where they're putting what we've done this cop city is in what we call the Wallani Forest. Um, and so it is one of the Essentially, one of the four areas in Atlanta that are forested, that we, that, that's referred to as one of the lungs, one of the four lungs of Atlanta. It is a forest uh, that was next to and or adjacent to a working class black community. Um, that community was promised the use of that forest as an intact for purposes of pipes, parks, uh, walking trails, a creek. That promise was destroyed, and then this land was turned over to the Atlanta Police Foundation. As I said, we started protesting. Uh, the city itself voted. We got the city council. Well, the city council voted for it in terms, you know, in the end. We turned about four or five votes, but uh, they still voted for it overwhelmingly. Um, and then new tactics began, and those tactics were the forest defenders, people who actually were conducting civil disobedience and direct action by going to the forest and staying in the forest and living there, putting tents and tree huts and so forth to defend the forest against having the trees cut down. Uh, and over that time period, that only increased, with the city felt we would all go away, but you know, we increased and kept going, and it also increased sort of the national profile for this particular battle. We started receiving more national media, uh, even uh, international media, and we kept on struggling around the issue. Um, and I will say there were acts of uh, civil disobedience, which included 
uh, trucks that came to, to burn, I mean, to, um, to knock down trees, those trucks were disabled, right? Those company trucks were disabled, they were taken apart. Um, the police, uh, the, well, I mean, the local Atlanta, the city government, joined into a task force with uh, the Atlanta Police Department, the DeKalb County Police Department, the DeKalb County Prosecutor's Office, the state uh, controlled Georgia Bureau of Investigation, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and Homeland Security. Uh, and we know this because there was a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information request from the Atlanta Police Foundation in which we received materials that, that, that showed that this task force existed and that showed that the purpose of this task force was to criminalize uh, the movement and to criminalize not only in terms of propaganda, and putting out information in local media to try to turn people away from the organizing that was happening, but also so it was the first time that we learned that they were contemplating using uh, domestic terrorism, state domestic terrorism charges against organizers. Uh, and I will also say, during the uh, initial uh, city council vote, uh, uh, there is an open line before the vote where citizens of Atlanta get to call in. Over 70% of those citizens that called in said they were opposed to Cop City being built. And the numbers would have been even greater than that if firefighters and police officers did not also call in. We know they were firefighters and police officers, so they identified themselves as such. Um, in the neighborhood that Cop City is supposed to be built, surveys have shown that over 90% of the population is opposed to this militarized structure being built. So they are going ahead, in spite of the fact that public opinion has been against it, to build it anyway. In December, and I'm going to wrap up very soon, in December, uh, the task force did a raid in the forest and arrested approximately eight forest defenders. All of those force defenders were charged with domestic terrorism. Uh, these folks, when they were arrested, they were sitting in tree huts and they were in their encampment. They were not doing any activities beyond what you would call civil disobedience by just being there. In January, January 18th, they did another raid. And during that raid, they arrested eight more organizers or force defenders and also charged them with domestic terrorism. And in addition to that, that's when they killed Tortillita, um, who was also part of the forest defectors. Uh, so quickly on Tortillita's Tortugita, death, um, they put out an immediate narrative that Tortillita shot, uh, shot at a state trooper, basically, and they returned fire. Um, and so that was their narrative, which the local media picked up right away and abandoned. Somehow, with five or six of these different agencies involved, they claimed that there was no body camera footage of any of this that took place, right? So the Atlanta Police Department is required to have body cameras on when they interact with the public or have these kinds of uh, interactions. Um, they said they had no body camera footage of it whatsoever. From reports in the community at the time, we heard, the folks told us, that they did not hear one shot and then a sudden return of fire. They heard a burst of fire. Thirdly, we don't believe the narrative that a force defender sitting in a tent decided to shoot one bullet basically at over a dozen cops and basically signing a death warrant and that those cops then opened up a return fire. Uh, and so we're calling for an independent investigation. Recently, they did release videotape, which we think even backed up our scenario even more, because you could hear the burst of fire as being an immediate burst of fire, and no one, one shot, and then maybe a blip or a second, and then a quick return of fire. Uh, you have the, the police officers themselves speculating that somebody might have shot their own because of the type of fire it was, which they deferred as to find this suppressed fire which in their vernacular means fire from the police. Um, so since that time, we have continued to organize and be active. Um, folks have been pushed out of the force, but we continue to, as folks know, you know, try to gain media attention around it, continue to then do demonstrations, uh, continue to do petition drives. Uh, on March, uh, this uh, late February, I put up some um, would send uh, uh, some links for you guys. But at late February, we're doing a week of action to continue to force defenders. And in March, we're also doing another week of action 
which would act on some people to come uh, from wherever they're at to participate in their week of action. Uh, and then on March 9th, we're scheduling a day of action against police violence, which we're trying to have people do every, anything they can to demonstrate resistance to Cop City and police violence and the killing in Memphis, wherever they're at, all across the country. And so I know I spoke a lot, but I'll leave it there at that. Come on. Um, and we have uh, QR codes for uh, the Sandy's Stop Cop City page. Are the dates on there and the calls to action in February and March, is that delineated there? That it should be there. That should be either there or the Force Defender uh, website. Okay. And those are the two main places you'll find it at. There's other call to actions that we also have. You can find on Community Movement Builders at our Stop the Cop City page, which is individual acts that folks can do, including calling, you know, calling the mayor's office, even if you don't live in Atlanta, calling corporations and telling them to uh, back out of the funding. I did mention. But this, uh, at minimum, this project is designated to cost 90 million. We think it's going to cost much more of that than they're taking loans out for. But at minimum, if there's 90 million dollars that dollars have been raised for this project, 60 million dollars of that has been raised through corporations, uh, corporations like Delta, UPS, Waffle House, um, all these, all these different corporations uh, have raised money for it. That you can also find on the website. We've asked people to call and to say that they are opposed to these corporations putting in resources for this. We also want folks to call the actual developers and tell them to get out, get off the plan or stop, that, stop uh, going forward with this plan. We've had some success in having some corporations leave, and we've had some success with having developers leave, but particularly once they get a lot of calls, emails, or such. Uh, we're also calling for the mid-air to uh, uh, basically uh, 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 Take back the leads, or uh, 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 yeah, basically just, just uh, take back the leads or whatever terminate leads is what I'm trying to say. Uh, we also asking for the city council to potentially go back and vote again to retract the leads. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Kamal. We know how incredibly super duper extra busy you are these days, and um, you're going to because we have to be out of the library by six plus we have call at six. Vermont Spring Her Campaign. Is there now? 